Tonight we are in Cardiff. Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel, James Cleverley, chairman of the Conservative Party. He campaigned for Boris Johnson as leader and for Brexit during the EU referendum. Born in Torvine, where he's now the local MP, trained barrister and Labour's shadow solicitor general, Nick Thomas-Simmons. Adam Price, a former MP, elected to the National Assembly of Wales in 2016 and since last year, the leader of Plaid Cymru. Previously an MP for both the Conservatives, then UKIP, now an Assembly member and leader of the Brexit Party in Wales, Mark Reckless, and the businesswoman and campaigner who's taken the government to the Supreme Court twice and won, Gina Miller. Welcome to our panel, to our audience here and, of course, to you at home. And we are, for the first time tonight, here in Cardiff in the Senate. So it is great to be in a Parliament tonight of all nights. Now, you don't have to be here, of course, to join in. You know the score. Hashtag BBCQT on Facebook, on Twitter and on Instagram. Join in the conversation. Right. Let's start with our first question tonight, which is from Maura Ellis. Is it Hamburg to worry about inflammatory language which fuels populism and conflict? Gina, let's start with you. Gosh. Um, I don't know where to start, almost. Um, having uh, worked extremely hard to put the MPs back where they should be yesterday, I watched in total horror and disgust yesterday at what I saw in the House, um, and not from any particular side. Um, the the ratcheting up of inflammatory language is not helping anyone on any side, any cause, doesn't matter how you vote, which party you belong to. This is about conducting yourself with de decency and respect. And actually, you know, now we have so many people tuning in to our parliament because of the Supreme Court. Um, I actually had someone from Holland say to me yesterday, a senior lawyer in Holland, say she was so anxious to see the first day back. And she thought it was a pari parody channel, the parliamentary channel, when she tuned in. Um, and, and I think we have to be very mindful, but there is this sort of scorched earth strategy going on here where you sort of divide and conquer and you ratchet up a lot of poison and hatred and I find it incredibly disturbing because whatever happens with Brexit what is going to be left after this is going to be take us years to come back from and this is not Great Britain this is not our country we're a decent tolerant country where people at the top should be setting an example and our parliamentarians should be ashamed of themselves. Are you ashamed, James? Um, I, I actually agree with much. Not, not all, but I agree with much of what <coughs> Gina has just said. Um, what we have seen uh, over the last few years is increasingly binary and confrontational politics. Uh, and, you know, I am very conscious that I have been, you know, a passionate advocate for my party and uh, my politics, but it is uncomfortable seeing how um, very divisive politics has become. It's not good and we do need to, we do need to resolve it. What Maura's, we saw... question, Maura's question in particular cites the word humbug. Now, Maura, I assume you're referring to uh, the Prime Minister's comment, uh, replying to uh, Labour MP Paul Le Chef, where she talked about death threats, abuse every day, quoting Boris Johnson's words, and he said, I've never heard such humbug in all my life. Uh, no, what... Um, what his response was to was uh, Paula, who I know and like very well. Uh, she attributed to him certain words that he had not said, and that's what he was saying was... A surrender wrong. act, he said that. Betrayal, well, he betray, he said betray. Uh, traitor, I'm not he sure he said that. that. OK, so two out of three. No, one out of three. Surrender so point... act and betray, he so, said that. So, he... so that's two out of three. That's so what he point, was responding to. The point to. is, Paula made... Paula suggested he had said things which he had not said. That's what he was responding to. One the thing. broader point... The broader point is that we do need to find opportunities where we can uh, be more collaborative, where we can come together, where we can focus on other things. Uh, the whole Brexit debate is, by its nature, 
uh, a very binary uh, topic, and that generates very binary but James, he could, have said, he could have set and the tone yesterday by saying sorry for lying, or, you know, to, not lying, but giving oh. unlawful advice <laughs> to the Queen. That would have set a different tone yesterday if, of all his words, being a classics, you know, scholar from Oxford, that's the one word he doesn't seem to be capable of finding, which is sorry. The Prime Minister... I mean, we may well come on to this subject uh, later. The point is that uh, I think we all have a duty to be careful in our language, and I think Gina was absolutely right when she said this hasn't come from only one side of the political debate. Um, I, I know that she has uh, withstood a volume and a ferociousness of abuse which nobody should have to deal with, um, and I would like to see that end. Uh, I happen to think that the sooner we can focus on topics like the economy and education and the NHS, where we are more aligned than divided, I think that will help bring some temperature out of this argument and help us move forward. Well, uh, Maura, what's your view on this, since you asked the question? What concerns me, mostly, is that we all lead very busy lives and not all of us can spend time looking at the minutiae of politics on Newsnight. Mm. And so quite often we go past news agents where we see the word traitor or betrayed and we hear Johnson ranting on about uh, surrender pacts and sometimes I feel the actual message gets lost in translation about what is really going on. Let's take it. the woman here. On a, um, on a more kind of practical level, if Boris Johnson wants to get his currently non-existent Brexit bill through Parliament, um, the paperless Brexit Brexit bill that he's trying to pass through Parliament, shouldn't he be a bit more civil to the opposition? <laughs> um, and instead of kind of touting this Trump-like stuff that he's coming out with in Parliament. Um, secondly, on a more principled level, I'd like to ask Mr Cleverly um, whether he thinks that um, a nice way to honour Joe Cox's memory might be to show some compassion and apologise. Well, does he agree? <laughs> The, the point that I was trying to make is that this is such a divisive... It is inherently a divisive issue, because it was a binary question, and there, there, there is no really easy but way... that wasn't a binary question. That was a very specific question, James. My question was, that would, it be nice, would it be a way to honour honor, um, Joe Cox's memory? Right. Um, would Boris Johnson apologising? Um, for? Showing, uh, for... Uh, what, yes, what happened yesterday in Parliament? Well, what, um, I, I was standing behind the Speaker's chair um, uh, when well, the Prime sorry, sorry, specifically the fact that he said the best way to honour Joe Cox's memory is to get Brexit done. Well, the Prime Minister, I mean, he could have used different language. I think the point he was trying to make, in fact, I know the point he was trying to make because I've spoken with him about it, was he was trying to say that resolving this issue will enable us to get on with other things that people are passionate about, but where there is, a, where there is, is uh, fundamentally much more unanimity. But, but... And, and, and I think that is... Uh, that is an, uh, an honourable and noble aspiration to get beyond this very divisive issue so we can start talking about things that bring us much more together. Right, James. So, so, so you're, not, you're not saying that Boris Johnson needs to apologise about what he said about Joe Cox? Is that correct? Well, no. I th I, the point I'm saying is that what he, what he said, what he <laughs> meant... Well, no, I don't think he should apologise. Okay, because, well, the okay. because, <laughs> because the point is, he was saying we want to get beyond this issue so we can talk about the things okay. that, that people are passionate about. We can't about, get like beyond it until he apologises. Like, okay, like education, like the health service. These are the things where we can come There's lots of hands up. Let's just hear a few more points before I get around the rest of the panel. Yes, the man in the white shirt. Hello. Uh, I think we got it wrong as a parliament, as a government and as a country yesterday by bringing up uh, that poor lady's name, Joe Cox. I don't want to go through it again this evening on a, on a BBC uh, a show. I think we should le leave that to the family. They're obviously going to be still grieving. It, it was a very uh, desperate situation uh, um, and I think a lot of us would appreciate it if, if that poor lady's name wasn't brought up again in politics. Uh, it's for the family. It's not for, it's not for us to bro bring that lady's name into... Uh, into the house. And the woman behind you. I think Jo Cox's name needs to be brought up because she was killed because of right-wing extremism and the language, the inflammatory language that was used yesterday, <clears throat> firstly by the Attorney General, whose speech got more and more inflammatory, I felt. He, he performed to Parliament rather than delivering um, 
delivering his, his speech, and he didn't apologise. And then Boris Johnson came in and didn't apologise. That set the tone of the whole debate. I watched it for hours yesterday, and I was appalled. <clears throat> and, Mr Cleverly, for you to say, let's get on to a different topic... Jo Swinson made a very good point yesterday. Her child is taught to say sorry. People needed to hear that yesterday from our Prime Minister. He has created chaos. He is creating this fear and incitement now between people in Parliament. And the language that he's used... He's an Oxford scholar. And for him to be saying that it was humbug... He knew exactly what he was saying, and I think it is a disgrace. And it doesn't matter, let's go on to a different topic. He needs to apologise. Okay. Let me let some of the rest of the panel again in here. I don't think the Prime Minister should have dismissed the particular concerns as humbug. And I think perhaps re re reflecting, I, I would suspect he would be of that view himself. But I don't think the level of anger out in the country primarily reflects what politicians are, are saying. I think it reflects what they're, what they're doing, and particularly that politicians are blocking Brexit. And... <laughs> there were three words Boris was accused of using. One traitor he didn't use, and is a word I wouldn't want to use either, but he said that, particularly Labour members, who said that they were, would back Brexit, that they respected the referendum, but are now blocking Brexit, he said that they betrayed their promises to their constituents. And I, I think that is correct. He then described this act as a surrender act. And the reason he did that is because it requires the government to accept any extension the EU offers and accept any conditions the EU offers offers. There is a provision to go back to the Commons, but given it says it, it won't accept no deal Brexit, that's not much for protection. So in terms of his language, I think his language was fair, and I do think it's important that we're able to use plain language to describe what politicians are doing when they said they'd back Brexit, respect the referendum, but they're now blocking it. Yeah, yeah. Nick. Well, firstly, I don't suggest for a moment that any political party has a monopoly on virtue, but I do think there is a special responsibility on the person who holds the highest political office in the land. And... <laughs> Paula Sheriff is somebody who's suffered appalling threats, rape threats, death threats, abuse online. I do think it was very wrong to dismiss the concern she raised as humbug I do think Boris Johnson should apologise. Young man over there. Perhaps it is time for a new speaker who actually combats this rhetoric from both sides. Well, John Burke is going to be standing down uh, reasonably soon. Is the man in the grey shirt with the hand up there? Um, I think perhaps language is maybe a secondary issue in the whole thing, uh, because in a few weeks' time, what politicians say will probably be forgotten. What is far more impactful is the fact that on both sides, people have abused parliamentary and legal, uh, both the prorogation, I'm taking note side, both the prorogation and the Supreme Court decision, I think, have undermined UK, the UK democratic system severely. And I think in the long term, that would be far more damaging than the language that is being used currently this week. Have you undermined democracy, Gina Miller, since you were the one to bring in that court case? Uh, no. Well, not, not just... I, was gonna say, yeah. I was gonna say, there's the prorogation itself, is not illegal. Every, it happens every year. It's a very normal act in, in the business of Parliament. But using it to bypass and close down our representatives, that was the bit that was illegal. Um, and it's a very unusual case, and we don't expect it to, you know, there probably won't be a case like this again for another however many years, because I don't expect a Prime Minister to behave as this one has, to actually be stretching our constitution and his legal boundaries to such a behaviour. No modern prime minister has done this. And connecting it with the language and the actions, this speaks to me of weakness and desperation, that you don't have 
a plan that is within the bounds of the law. You can't speak in a debate in a civil tongue. That speaks to me of weakness. And I think that the case when those people who think this undermined democracy, we are a representative democracy. Until that changes, then parliamentary sovereignty is the central core principle of the stability of our country. And whatever happens with Brexit, after that, if we have a system that is not respecting parliamentary sovereignty and the separation of powers, then we, have, we are diminished by it as a country, as a democracy, and as a constitution. And that is why the case was important, because what it did was actually confirm the separation of powers and confirmed that no prime minister is above the law, even though I am aware that Boris Johnson thinks he is a law and himself, he is not. Okay. Um, Adam Price, let's come back to the original question that, that Maura asked. Is it humbug to worry about inflammatory language? Well, look, you know, I, I, I looked at... Uh, House of Commons yesterday, and you know, it, it it felt like staring into the abyss, right? And you know, the, the 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 sensible thing to do when you stare into the abyss is to take a step back, right? These are very very dangerous times, right? I, I was a, I was a member of Parliament for nine years at a very at what I thought was a very divisive time during the war in Iraq. Um, I've seen nothing like the level of toxicity in, in our politics that I'm seeing now, right, OK? And we, uh, we, uh, there, there are huge things at stake, which go way beyond Bre Brexit, OK? There is a level of anger in our, in our politics, OK, which actually is paralysing us now, right? We're not able to have a civil conversation, right? Politics is about passionate disagreement, but it is also about the ability to have a dialogue with, with each other because you know what, you may have a little bit of the truth over there. And if I just demonise you all the time, then I can't actually listen to you and learn something by having that conversation. Uh, collapse, uh, trust is collapsing in all of our institutions, right? This is what is at stake for us. And so, yes, look, there is a self-denying ordinance. I, I use colourful language sometimes in politics. As, I'm a passionate person as well. But we all of us now have to temper uh, some of our language. We have to kind of start to listen to each other again. That doesn't mean that we, we still don't get to disagree on these matters. But if we continue down the road that we're going on now, it's not going to end well for any of us. Well, let's move on to another question. We, we've, we've touched on it, but let's hear from David Tandy. We all break laws on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you think it's acceptable to do so if it's in the national interest? Do we all break laws on a day-to-day -day basis? Oh, David, do you have personal experience of that? <laughs> Forgetting to indicate uh, traffic laws, we all, uh, we all uh, break a small law now and again. <laughs> as long as we can justify it. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> are, you, are you in the law business for, for some... I'm just wondering. Yeah, I'm a police officer. Oh, I see. <laughs> oh, marvellous. Right. Well, look, James Clear, I guess I'm going to come to you. I mean, uh, I mean, Boris Johnson yesterday was saying the Supreme Court is wrong. I mean, British jails are full of people who think the verdict is wrong. Yeah, well, there's what lots of Boris people. What makes Boris Johnson so different? No, he's not unique. There are lots of people who, who by definition, thought the uh, Supreme Court judgment was wrong. Everyone that argued against it, so our, our lawyers argued against it. Um, Lord Chief Justice... Uh, came to a different conclusion, so he clearly thought they, the, 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 so he, that are, uh, they were the highest judges in the land. Oh yes, but the, so they are the ultimate arbiters. Oh yes, and uh, we absolutely respect the uh, the judgment that they made. Um, but as I say, I disagree with it. The Prime Minister disagreed with it. The Lord Chief Justice disagreed with he it. Didn't the Master of the no, Rolls no, the and the President didn't, of the no, no, they didn't. Bench sorry, Division. Because sorry, stop they saying came that. To, That's not true. Because they came. That's to, not hang on. true, James. Uh, That's not true. Because the three court, uh, judges in the High Court did not discuss the case. What they said was that they couldn't get over the justiciability mm. barrier, therefore referred it up to the High Court. They said it had merit and referred it up to the Supreme Court. So they never actually discussed the case and said it wasn't a case that was worth discussing. And that's really that's, important. I know, that's, no, but the... But the so that is, that's what happened. So uh, the Supreme Court... Um, the Supreme Court came to a, a judgment. We absolutely respect that judgment, which is why the House of Commons uh, sat this week. This is why we came back, because we absolutely respect the judgment. Respecting and disagreeing, and this goes to the point, the broader point that we're making, is you can disagree uh, and maintain respect, and that's, that's our position. We respect the judgment, we will abide by the judgment. You respect it, but you disagree. reject it. No, we disagree with it. No, no. 
and this is really important, we, you, we absolutely respect it, which is why we've returned and which is why we, we abide by the decision. It is completely legitimate to disagree with a, 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 a judgment, but also comply with it, and that's what's happening. Can I just ask you about something that, that's breaking this evening, actually, just before we came on air, which is in terms of uh, David's question, breaking laws. There's obviously the Ben law now, which uh, would require the government to either get a deal by October 31st, uh, and if it doesn't have a deal and Parliament doesn't accept no deal, an extension has to be requested. Now, John Major was talking this evening, saying that there may be a way around this and that the government may, in fact, try to bypass statute law by, I mean, it's pretty involved, folks, I've got to tell you, but by passing an order of council to suspend the Ben Act. The Can council. you rule that out? Uh, there is no such thing as the Ben Act, and we were talking well, about that the... that particular law. Can you rule out no, what on. John so, Major is suggesting as a, as so a way around it? So the Prime Minister was criticised uh, uh, in questions earlier for using a shorthand. The uh, uh, EU Withdrawal Number 2 Act, which is the one you're referring to, which uh, the Prime Minister described as a surrender act for the... No, 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 we've done all that. We've done all that. I'm asking very is, specifically... The, the Prime Minister has been clear, the Prime Minister has been clear that he and government abides by the law, but he's also... But by that particular law? Yeah, well, by all laws. Right, OK. And, and this suggestion that John Major's making tonight, and it's getting a lot of traction in the news, that the government may seek, may seek to bypass that law by passing an order of council to suspend it until after 31st October, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to discuss how we're going to progress in this. <laughs> no, I'm not going to discuss, because... So it could happen. No, and i tell you why. i tell you why, because what we have seen in Parliament is people uh, bending conventions... Uh, uh, stepping outside standing orders, making up uh, new procedures on the hoof in order to prevent Brexit being delivered in the face of the largest electoral event in our country's history. And what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to talk through how the government intends to discharge its business, knowing full well that there are a whole load of people who will try and distort every procedure that we have in British politics to try and prevent that. And uh, hopefully people will understand why I'm a little bit reticent uh, as explaining exactly how other people uh, will try and prevent the government discharging uh, yeah. its duty. Reticent to rule it out. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Firstly, I think it's the position that we started, and that's that I'm sure there are people in this room today who think we have some laws that are sensible. I'm sure there are people that think we have other laws that are not so sensible. But you are all, we are all, expected to comply with the law. And we will. Now, the issue that arises here is that it cannot be the case that Boris Johnson is treated in a different way from the rest of us, that he can choose to defy the law when he wants to, but that doesn't apply to anybody else. Like, everyone in this room, he should respect the rule of law. He should comply with the Act of Parliament that's been passed. And, I mean, what James is... James is saying that he won't rule out using an ordering council procedure to defeat the statutory purpose of the bill is quite extraordinary. And if the government gets into that position, our constitutional crisis will be all the grave. Now, what I said is I'm not going to discuss. What I made clear is that the Prime Minister and the government will abide by the law. Adam. <laughs> Uh, is, uh, they're called Henry VIII poems, aren't they? I mean, yes. you know, so, yeah, essentially. Yeah. I mean, so that's that's what we're going back to, folks. Okay, you know, uh, you know, before uh, the, the you know the. Uh, uh, the sort of parliamentary democracy kind of uh, became the fundamental principle of a constitution. Uh, you know, look, I, I think um, it's important uh, that uh, we, we emphasise, of course, the central fact in our constitution that actually nobody, uh, be they so high, is above the law. And actually, that includes the Prime Minister. You know, the government actually is also itself uh, subject to legal restraints. Uh, because the opposite of that, uh, of course, is, is you know, is, is tyranny or anarchy, right? So it's part of our constitution. We have a balanced constitution. We have parliament there. We have, uh, obviously, the executive and then the courts working in tandem so we can actually have uh, a, a proper uh, system based on the rule of, of law. And, you know, uh, I mean, essentially, I welcome the core, the core decision that the court made really, was that you can't have a system of, de of parliamentary democracy and give an unfettered right to the government 
to actually suspend Parliament indefinitely, yeah? So there has to be a reasonable limit. If it was a prorogation of five or six days, the average, then that would have been reasonable. You go beyond that, and particularly when you don't provide a good reason for, for that, then obviously then you are beginning to suspend Parliament in a way that prevents Parliament doing its job. So I think, what, take Brexit out of it, right? There will be other issues in the future where you will, you will have different sympathies, maybe, if you didn't agree with the effect of, of this in the short term politically, you, we should all be glad of the fact that we live in a country where democratic principles and the rule of law okay. at the heart of what happens, because that isn't true in many, many other parts of the world. There are lots of hands up. I just want to get round a few of you. Yes, the man there in the check check. You say Boris Johnson respects the Supreme Court ruling, but he's proven time and time again that he doesn't really respect anything. He doesn't respect the rule of law. He, well, in what part of that circus act that he put on yesterday was he respecting the ruling of the Supreme Court? By virtue of the fact we're in Parliament was respecting the because outcome. He was to. James, I'm going to the get speaker early. told him he had to come back. He didn't choose to come back. Okay. He was made to fly back from New York to be there to be held accountable for the things that he's trying to do. Let me just get round a few of the audience here. Yes, the man there. <laughs> in the grey uh, In the structure. Um, isn't the law being used to vitiate the result of the referendum? The man in the T-shirt at the back. Uh, you talk about respect and you talk about um, obeying laws and, and following laws, yet no one is respecting the law that said 17.4 million people voted Brexit. Yeah. None of you are respecting that. I mean, I... We've, no, Jean, we've no idea whether this Privy Council malarkey, yeah. whatever, whatever it is, I hadn't heard of it, but I have to be honest, before this evening, whether or not the government may do that. But if there's nothing unlawful about it, why shouldn't they? Well, they shouldn't. If I could just... Yeah, but why shouldn't the they? Gentleman. Why shouldn't no, 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 they? No, it, it, this is so difficult because we have an unwritten constitution and as long as they're within the law, there's nothing wrong with that. And this is the whole thing. They, you know, I've, I hear people up in arms, MPs up in arms, because they're saying, oh, Boris might prorogue again. Well, if he does it legally, he's allowed to prorogue Parliament before a Queen's speech, as long as it's four or five days or six days or however many days that it... So, as long as he's acting within the law, what I would wish, I hoped, when, you know, if I hadn't taken this action, you know, MPs shouldn't be, wouldn't have been back where they should be, doing the job we pay them to do. But I have to say, the amount of time and effort I hear being expelled in trying to find ways out of things and trying to find really ancient tools. And why don't they use that time and effort into trying to get the deal going to Europe? Use your energy in a different way with the time we've got left. Okay. I have a bit more from the audience. Yes, the man there. Surely there was 520 odd MPs voted for the referendum. So once the referendum result came in and 17.4 million people voted to leave, surely that is the law because it's our parliament and you MPs should have acted on that. Can and I... we wouldn't be in this position now yeah. where everybody's arguing. Can We'd I answer this Europe question? Briefly, Gina, because we've heard it The already. two gentlemen, just together. Because actually, this idea that the MPs are not doing anything. The, MP, the, the, the MPs voted by, um, to trigger Article 50. They then voted to pass the um, Withdrawal Act. Then they, the, the, uh, there is a Withdrawal Act in place in 2018. So they've actually passed three bits of legislation to enact the referendum, and they're now having to go towards the last bit of this. So this idea that they're acting, I don't understand. You have to look at what they've been trying to do. And this idea that MPs are trying to frustrate, what they they're doing, no, no, they they're discussing. They I'm and, sorry, and you, but- And you're not helping. <laughs> well, that, that's your opinion. That's your opinion. Well done. Uh, th that, is, that is your opinion, but I thought we were going to bring back everything to our lords and our courts, and they were going to be the well, ones who decided well, surely, everything. Because we, the MPs, couldn't decide about staying in Europe. So they asked well, us. Well, they haven't got to the end yet. So. They asked us what, what the, our opinions were. Yeah. We voted to leave. But I'm saying that End they the carried sports. on doing that, though. We sports. haven't got to the end yet. No, because all you lot don't, don't want us to get to the end. Well, we I'm shouldn't be there MP. now. We should be out of Europe. Well, if they got gotten... I, I'm not the MP, so I'm not in Parliament. Okay, they have well, to let's do no, but you were, let's you, stop. You were stopping us doing it. No, I haven't. I've made sure it's legal. No, no, what, what's legal? No, I have. Okay. It, because it, it, under Article 50, if it doesn't comply with our constitutional requirements, we will be, we will be actually contravening well, international law. Would you have done it the other way back? 
Yeah. Yes, I would have. <laughs> because I've been, so, con so I've been a campaigner for 30 years. I've been doing this for a very long time, keeping so, an, a tabs on what's going on. This is a, not just if overnight. It, if it was a Remain government and a Brexit parliament, you would have done Who exactly the same. You would have tried to break the law. You would have yes. done exactly the same. I've been doing this 10 years ago. I would have. I've been doing it the whole time. Look at what, uh, you know, the previous government 10 years ago, in the space of one year, they used secondary legislation 96 times to take away our rights, and there were letters being flown sent off to them all the time saying you can't do this with Henry VIII powers. So oh, I've been doing this for a very long time. Mark Reckless. In a democracy where laws are properly made and properly interpreted, of course we should obey the law. The problem we now have, and we've heard a, about this from the audience, is that people voted to leave the European Union. They were told they were being given the decision and the government would implement what you decided. But that hasn't been happened. Brexit is being blocked by people who don't like Brexit, by people who voted Remain and think their views are of greater value than the majority who voted to leave. And we are seeing in Parliament, and Fred, as James was saying, we're seeing the procedures of the House of Commons, the standing orders, abused. And frankly, we have had someone in the chair who has allowed his own personal preference for Remain to influence how he assesses and, frankly, breaks those standing orders. And that's how this Surrender Act was passed. And then we think about the interpretation of the... John Burko has obviously always insisted that he doesn't have a preference. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he says. <laughs> you uh, believe that, you'd, uh, you'd believe anything. But laws also need to be properly interpreted. And we have a Supreme Court that came to a judgment which described by Lord Sumption, who retired from the court just nine months ago and has made a, a career out of urging judicial restraint. But on this occasion, he said that the judgment was revolutionary but he supported it. And unlike the justices, he's actually been quite open about some of his reasons and some of the background to that. He says that the referendum was misguided and therefore he's pleased that the powers are being pushed back to Parliament because the 52% shouldn't be allowed to enjoy 100% of their victory. Parliament should ensure we stay in the EEA or in the customs union because of supposedly how narrow it was. Now, would he be saying that if it was the other way around? If Leave had lost, Remain had got 52%, would he be saying we should leave the European Union and perhaps go into the EEA to take account of that 48%? No, of course he wouldn't. He said that referendum was nothing more than a snapshot of yes, public but he opinion. He's not one of the 11 judges, Mark. He's not one of the 11 judges. He was, he was one of the judges on Gina's previous case. Yes, but he wasn't on the but, one this week. And in week. that case, he, so dismissed, he dismissed the tried and tested <laughs> rules of statutory interpretation. In this case, there had been a law passed to implement the Treaty of Lisbon. Article 49, called the Passerelle Clause, to allow treaties well that full process, it put restrictions on how the government could use that. But Parliament put no equivalent restrictions on Article 50. Maybe, yeah, he maybe, threw okay. away rather those than, rules and than... he interpreted it to rule in favour well, of Gina against the government and it's been the effect of putting a roadblock in the way of Brexit. This, he's not in this, in this well, trial. I, I think his remark He was in the previous trial and I think his remarks in the media, okay. given he only retired nine months ago, are ill-advised because people may see it much more through the prism of leave and remain if you've recently retired justices saying the referendum was misguided. Before we go any further... I can see this is going to go backwards and forwards. I just need to tell you that next week we'll be in Wallasey. That's very important. Next week we'll be in Wallasey and the following week we're in Beckenham with Thea Pafitis, who's a dragon, of course, on Dragon BBC's Dragon Den. And if you want to be in the audience, and I can guarantee it will be lovely if tonight is only to go by, if you'd like to be in the audience, call 0330 or, of course, you can go to the Question Time website and you can follow the instructions there. Let's take another question from Jamie Jenkins. Yeah, isn't it time for the opposition parties to admit that they will never vote for any deal that Boris negotiates? Adam? 
Well, uh, you know, we, we certainly uh, don't agree with the kind of extreme, you know, uh, uh, hard Brexit vision that uh, he so far set out. Uh, but you can know, you envisage we're, we're voting all, for all, any all, yes. Well, at the deal moment, all we, all, all we have is a blank piece of paper. That's all the European Union has. So, you know, listen, we'll, 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 we'll listen to anyone, uh, what anyone has to say. But it's very, uh, If he gets likely. rid of the backstop, look, will you vote for it? I mean... Uh, no, look, uh, look. Can I, can I, can I suggest? Can I, can I, can I, can I, can I, look, look, can I, can I suggest? Right, okay. Look, um, the only way uh, we, we, we're in this position, right, because there was an election, right, in 2017, uh, uh, MPs elected by the people uh, that didn't support the policy that was presented by the Conservative government, and essentially we've had a hung Parliament. The Conservative Party hasn't even been able to agree amongst itself, and we're stuck. We're going round in circles, and can we all agree that we don't want to be having this conversation in the question times years in the future? Right? Oh so we've yes, got to find, let's we've agree got that. To find, we've got don't to find think? a resolution. Now, now, what's likely to happen is Parliament is going to be continually going round in circles, all kinds of interesting techniques techniques on both sides tried everywhere, right? It's not going to solve anything. We're going to still be in the, the same position. We may have an election. I can tell you now, that election won't solve anything. It'll be another hung parliament and we'll be back exactly the same place. Now, I can understand why people uh, that voted leave don't uh, 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 agree with this. They don't like it. They feel that they're not being listened to. I understand that. That was part of the reason why many people voted leave, right? But I can tell you now, the only way that we're going to resolve this, Parliament's not going to do it. This Parliament's not going to resolve it. The next parliament's not uh, resolve it. We've got to take it back to where it began. We've got to take it back to the people. I'll tell you I, one, one last line. Briefly. One last line. And, and look, I understand where the gentleman is coming. One last line, right? Okay. This next referendum clearly has to be not an advisory referendum. It has to be a binding <laughs> referendum in law. And let the, let the people have their final say and let's get on. Mom. What happened to the newer kind of gentle politics? <laughs> well, I'm afraid, Adam, you are getting, you're getting the reaction you are because we had a referendum and you refused to respect the result. Now, Plaid Cymru did... Now, Plaid Cymru didn't oppose having the referendum, you abstained. But when you didn't like the result, you've sought to undermine it, you have campaigned against it, and you have refused to accept the results. And we are a democracy, and our democracy can only function if the losers consent. And when I lose an election, as I did in Rochester in 2015, I accepted the result. We had a referendum in 2016. We need to implement the result. If you have a referendum, ask the people that some politicians don't like the result and then tell them they have to vote again without implementing what they've said, then you undermine democracy and you cause massive anger. <laughs> What, what, what yes, you said, Adam, Adam, what, I need what, to get round the rest yeah, of the panel. Well, what you said is actually not correct, OK? After the referendum, right, we, we, we put forward a proposal, right, OK? A proposal which actually was the least damaging Brexit, which would uh, m maintain access to the single market. We weren't listened to because what, what we had increasingly, the Conservative government went further and further to the extremes. It's polarised debates to, to, uh, to the point now where the only resolution is to take it back to the people's vote. Otherwise, this is going to go on forever. It's going to go on forever. You put, you put forward a Brexit in name only, Adam. The, the, the leaflet that went to every household in the country had a line which is famous. We will implement your decision. It was a promise that was made by both sides of the referendum. In the, uh, in the, in the days leading up to the referendum itself, I was being interviewed by Nick Watt, who was at Newsnight, and this was when the universal expectation was that Remain was going to win. And he asked me, if you lose by even 1%, will you accept the result? And I said, yes, absolutely. That's how referenda worked. Against expectations, leave won that referendum. In the days immediately afterwards, senior voices in the Liberal Democrats said, you have to respect the referendum result. Senior voices in the Labour Party said, you have to respect the referendum result. Fast forward, fast forward a few years, and suddenly the Liberal Democrats are saying they're going to scrap Article 50 without even reference to another referendum. Uh, uh, other political parties are saying that 
please believe us, because whilst we didn't respect the last referendum, <laughs> we will definitely respect the next <laughs> referendum as long as we get the result we want this time round. And there do you are... think... And do you think Boris Johnson is going around about it the right way to try and build consensus with the opposition, given what happened yesterday? Theresa May... Is that consensus Theresa building? May burnt through all her political capital. She sacrificed her career in an attempt to get the consensus. She invited leaders, the opposition parties in. She received assurances that in certain circumstances, if, for example... But has Boris Johnson if, then decided the days of consensus if, are over? If, for example, she was, she was told, if, for example, the, the future declaration was stripped away from the withdrawal agreement, that was something Labour MPs could vote for, the future declaration was stripped away from the withdrawal agreement, and then they refused to vote for it after all. And people say, oh, if you brought it back, we will vote for it this time. Well, let's see. Let's see. <laughs> the Prime Minister is negotiating really hard. We've seen movement, small amounts of movement, but we've seen movement on the EU's position. He is working to get a deal, and if he can bring that deal back, we will see whether those MPs are as good as their word and will vote for it. But we have also made it absolutely clear, for, actually, for many of the reasons that you said, we cannot just go round in circles. We were brought back from the prorogation, and what did we see yesterday? Another three hours of debate, added to the previous 500 hours of debate that we have already had, and no further forward. Not a single new argument was put forward in yesterday's debate. We cannot keep going round like this. We've got to resolve this issue so we can move on. And as I say, okay. talk about police and hospitals okay. and education and transport, which are the things that people like you tell me when I'm on the doorstep, they want politicians to be talking about. Let's come back to the original question. Is it time for the opposition parties, this is Jamie's question, to admit that they will never vote for any deal Boris Johnson negotiates? Well, I... Would you vote for a deal? Well, let me just explain. I have voted in Parliament for the option of leaving the European Union with the Customs Union in place. I voted for the option of leaving where there was strong single market uh, access. And why I, did I do that? Because it both re respected the referendum result, but also protected jobs and livelihoods in my constituency. The question is, would you vote for any deal now, that Boris though, Johnson Now, back? though, I think the problem is that we've come so far from the original 2016 position the kind of Brexit that Boris Johnson is driving towards is a hard, no-deal Brexit. I cannot support a no-deal Brexit. I believe it would damage jobs and livelihoods in my constituency. That is not something that I can support, nor do I believe it has a democratic mandate. So what I believe the way forward should be is, firstly, to take that option off the table, ensure that it is off the table. I think we then need to have a general election. And our party policy has decided at our conference last week is within six months of that election, we will then put this issue with a credible leave option and a remain option back <laughs> in to the in referendum. <laughs> How will you campaign that into? Uh, what I, what I, leave or remain? No, what I will do is what I have done all along uh, for this, and that is to judge the deal that is put before me. I will look at that deal when it is negotiated, and I will then make that judgment and put it to my constituents. Woman then. How can we use the word democracy when the margins were so small, 52%, 2% 2 wanted Brexit, more than the... 4%, but almost half the country... 52 to 48. But half, almost half the country desperately want to remain in the EU, P potentially more now that people are old enough to vote. Almost the young... <laughs> the man in the church shirt here. Nick. Nick, how can you say your constituents don't want a no-deal? Have you asked any of them? I'm from your constituency. I'd be happy with a no-deal. Yeah, yeah. I believe that all our MPs now should be more honest, more trustworthy, show more integrity. Listen to us. We voted out at a referendum. How many more times have we got to vote before we leave? Gina. Take this back to um, because I'm not a politician, but it, uh, from a business perspective. So there was a promise. You know, you had your package when we were voting in the referendum, and as leavers, I would say you have to be. You should be. I would suggest very, very angry. Not just because we haven't actually progressed, but also because if you judge against what was promised. It was going to be the easiest trade deals in the world. We'll be able to, you know, we'll be able to um, get, you know, all the car industry in Germany would be so worried that they will bend over backwards to make sure that everything is going to work. Those things have not happened. 
And we actually don't have... I'm sorry, but we don't have those trade deals in place. No, we don't allowed. have... We're not no, no, we we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not allowed we're to even... It. No, no, but... It was going to be the easiest thing, and we're, we're going to have to go to the WTO. We we're not allowed no, to no. negotiate trade deals because we're no, a member but, of the European but, Union. But then why was Liam Fox flying around the world polluting the planet? Because, because, because I thought he, he is, was going around seeing because he has, lots of because he has signed a large number of continuity deals. But we are not but, allowed to sign... In, we are not allowed to have an independent trade policy no, no. until we have left the European Union. You're allowed to European talk to other Union, countries. Which is what we're doing. Yeah. Which is and why Liam Fox was flying yeah, around the world. And when the other countries have said so far... Um, for example, India has said that we're very interested, um, but we'd also like free movement for quite a few of our people. Well, you India need to be have honest. A trade deal with the okay, no, 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 is a really, really important word because the Yellowhammer reports, the next versions are supposed to be coming updated soon, then surely everybody, because whatever you voted, leavers don't live in a bubble and remainers don't live in a bubble. The effects of whatever happens next is going to affect all of us because we all live in the same country. So the fact is, surely we should make informed decisions. And I have to say my preference would be for a general election because at the moment, I don't trust any of you. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't think... We're, we're in this perverse... We're in this... We're in this, um, we're in this weird... We're in this weird situation. We're in this weird situation where the uh, government does not have a majority, is the point that Adam made, um, and that uh, members of Parliament are using centuries-old uh, procedures which have, which have not been used for centuries to dictate the government's actions. And then when we have said, look, if you want to be the government, have a general election, test your hypothesis uh, uh, with the British electorate, and if they want you to be the government, then you can be the government. And what's Labour's response? No. We don't want to be the government, but we don't want you to be the government either. Well, and that's why we're in this ridiculous... <laughs> Well, their response is they don't want a general election just yet, but I need to let Mark answer the original question. Is it time for the opposition party to admit they'll never vote for any deal Boris negotiates? Will you want a clean Brexit, what you call a no deal? I think they should admit that, because what they want to do is block Brexit. What I agree with Gina, that we should have a general election, but unfortunately those who lost the last election, uh, particularly Labour, don't want to have an election, keep on voting against it, because they want to use their current position in order to block Brexit. But the problem is made worse by the promises that Theresa May said. She said that we would leave the customs union. She said we would leave the single market. She said we would leave the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. Yet with her deal, none of those things happened. She tried to keep us in the customs union. She signed up to a backstop that we'd never be able to leave without the European Union's permission and said we'd continue obeying their laws in all these different areas while having no say in them. That wasn't Brexit. And our concern in the Brexit party is Boris will make a few little tweaks to the deal and either get it voted through uh, Parliament or he'll go to the, have an election and if he does win that election, will he actually stick to what he's been saying about a proper Brexit or will he go back towards where Theresa May was? And what Nigel Farage said on... Uh, the day programme yesterday was we would like to see a clean break Brexit, but we would also support a Canada style free trade agreement as the Conservatives initially promised that would genuinely give us back our independence and give us what we voted for. Okay. <laughs> Let's take another question from Rosalind Beck. Where are you, Rosalind? There you uh, are. Philosophers consider envy to be evil and destructive. Is it envy which fuels Labour's desire to steal other people's property? Now, Rosalind, I assume you're talking, you're talking about private schools there. I'm talking about private schools. I'm talking about the more recent one, which uh, I think was announced yesterday, about um, empty homes, if they're empty for six months, that uh, they say that the councils can just compulsorily purchase them. Um, they, they, pre prior to that, we had John McDonnell saying about just over a week ago um, that landlords would be forced to sell their properties to their tenants at some price that he would set, which we all know would just be nothing and would be the equivalent of stealing property. We've got the shares as well. OK, so there's a long list there. I mean, I mean looking at... Yes. So let's pick one, private schools. I mean, the motion at the Labour conference said that uh, private schools would have their assets redistributed. Mm. As, a, as a former barrister, do you support that? 
I do support the thrust of this policy. And can <laughs> I just say, no, 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 what I don't support, and I'll be absolutely clear, I, will, I would never support any policy that broke the law, and any Labour government will respect the rule of law. But, what, but there, is a, there is a debate to, to be around? had here, because there are, what, 7% of the population go to independent schools, 93% go to state schools. Now, nobody can help their background, but there is a systemic problem when that 7% is dominating at the top of all our professions. And we need to look radically at that. But so, that's actually not what the question is about. I don't think Rosalind is taking issue with that. What Rosalind is talking about is... is is theft. That would not happen. The point that so the I'm redistribution making... of assets wouldn't happen. What we are looking at is three things. Is that okay? what you're saying? Three things. Not illegal redistribution, sequestration of assets. However you want to call it, would not happen. What there are three points to this policy. Number one, we would introduce first of all VAT on private school fees, and that money would be used to fund free school meals. Secondly, we would take away the charitable status of independent schools. So all the money that's currently been spent to subsidise them in terms of business rates could be spent more equitably elsewhere. The issue in the motion, the thrust of the motion, is about looking at longer term, could we then tear down the walls between the state and private sector in education, have them back in the state sector. To do that, we would ask the Social Mobility Commission to look at it, to do it in a fair and obviously lawful way. But let's not move away from the central point here. We all live in a country, I'm afraid, where the circumstances into which you are born determine far more where you end up than your talents or your efforts. That has to change and we have to think radically about it. I'm going to ask you to be brief because we're coming close to the, the programme. James. I mean, what we are seeing from the Labour Party is a reversion to a politics of envy that we haven't seen in British politics for a very, very long time. I go all around uh, the country um, and I see aspirational parents, many of whom from ethnic backgrounds. And if you go to a lot of private schools, you will see children of families who have made huge personal sacrifices to give their children a good education. And I think it is perverse to criticise parents for doing so, just as Diane Abbott did and Charmi Chakrabarti did, and, you know, I've never criticised them for um, supporting their children's uh, educations. The seizure, the, the seizure of assets is deeply wrong. We've seen it in uh, uh, private uh, residential property, with the reference you made. Assets of, uh, uh, of schools. We see uh, business uh, assets going to be stripped and, uh, again, redistributed by a Labour government, and if that doesn't sound sinister to you, it really should. And the thing is, these policies... Briefly, James. These policies would break the British economy, and the people who suffer when the British economy breaks are not the international jet-setting people, because they can move themselves and their money to other jurisdictions. It will be the people who cannot run away from the economic collapse that a Labour government will bring. It will be the teachers in state schools and doctors and nurses and council workers and small business owners and the people like you in this audience, you will be the ones left holding the baby. I've obviously got and a completely different understanding of the word brief. Um, thank you, James. We get the point. I'm going to move on to Gina. In the Gina. Of left -wing government. At, the, at the moment, we seem to have two main political parties who are going more and more extreme. And the problem is that, you know, the, that uh, you can't talk because of austerity and what you've done to the country. Um, and I think that the fact is that, um, you know, the, the idea of, of just uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater, the problem we have with our educational system is not just about independent schools. You know, we have teachers who are teaching maths when they don't have a, a degree in maths or any sort of qualifications. The average salary is £13,000. You know, we don't value teachers. And how are you going to close schools, you know, the extreme close independent schools? We need to build about 90 more schools just to get the kids in one town into schools. And where are you going to put all the people from private school? I mean, it's about fairness and both main parties, I believe, should actually come together and look at policies that are fair. We need a fair society, not an extreme one. Mark Reckless. I think in what is proposed by 
Labour. Reminds me almost of the, the, the dissolution of the monasteries. You've had these private schools built up over centuries, and the Labour Party policy as passed by Labour Conference, whatever Nick says now, is to expropriate the assets of those private schools and redistribute them to the state sector. Uh, and the lady mentioned it's not just schools, there's other areas they want to do it to, to housing. And I, I think just a, a, a announced yesterday the pharmaceutical industry. If you've spent all this money developing a drug, Jeremy Corgan's going to set up a state-owned generic drug manufacturer. He's going to force the drug companies to give their drugs and how they're made to the state. And then the state's going to supply the NHS with little or no... <laughs> With respect, Mike, I think that misunderstands the policy. And I mean, I've done a lot of campaigning on access to cancer drugs, what are called repurposed drugs, you know, drugs licensed for one use, but they then have another excellent use. And you just can't get those drugs to the patients. Mm. Yes, absolutely. A drug company that invests in the research that's required gets a patent to be able to make some money out of that. But what you can't have is a block from big pharmaceutical companies after that, preventing drugs from getting to the public. And the suggestion that we've made about looking, in addition to the private sector that's there, yes, a publicly owned body, that would really assist and it would have the impact of making sure that patients who require the drugs desperately actually get them. The impact. Adam. The impact you would Hang have. On, I just need, I just need to let Adam come. I just need to let Adam come. Uh, uh, seeing as we go in the Senate, the, the thing that occurs to me with the uh, publicly owned gen gen generics manufacturing you just, idea you just mentioned, uh, the free social care in, that you've also announced as a policy for England the next election, you're in government here in Wales. Why don't you do that now? <laughs> you're, 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 and you know. You, 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 you made, I think, a passionate case for the, the, the problems of, of uh, inequality of educational opportunity. You could ban private education in Wales. You're in government here. Why don't you do it here? What's the answer, well, Nick? Well, first of all, I mean, you, you'll be aware, Adam, on health and social care. What's, what's spending per head? It's about 11% higher here in Wales under a I'm Labour government you specifically than a, a, in about your policy England. on private schools that you've just, you know... You've in just in terms mentioned. of the adoption of that policy, which has just gone through our commons, we'll now look, of course, at implementing it in the months and years ahead in Wales as well as everywhere else. Look, I mean, the, F Finland was mentioned by Jeremy Corbyn. It's the, it's the only it country in Europe school. where actually you can't uh, pay for uh, education. But he missed the key point. It has, a, it has the most successful education system in the world. But the key point is, in in the state sector in Finland, they pay teachers way above what we what we are able to do, and they're able to then attract the best into teaching. You know, everyone in teaching at kindergarten level has a master's degree. I mean, that's the level of ambition. So you've you've, you've focused on the wrong. Uh, element of the Finnish recipe for success. What we should be doing is investing in our state education system so this is just as good as the independent sector so nobody actually wants to, needs to send their children there at all. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Mark, I know you want to come back in. I, I'm, we've got ten seconds and I feel we, we, are, we are out of time, so, so forgive me for that. I've just, I know... I, I've just focused on how extreme the policies were coming out of the Labour Party conference, and that's before we even look at what they're saying about extending free movement to not just Europe, okay. but the whole world. Let's not get on to, to another subject, but we <laughs> hear you. I just want to say... Oh, I just like get word in edgeways, actually. I don't, I don't know about you. Um, th that is almost it from us. Our next programme is in Wallasey. The following week, we're in Beckenham. You know the score by now. Call 0330 if you'd like to be in the audience, or you can go to the question and website. You can follow the instructions there. Our hour is up. Thank you to my panel, to all of you here, and, of course, to you at home for listening and watching. But before we go, it is 40 years of question time tonight. It is our 40th anniversary. So... I know. We made it. So before we go, I just want to leave you... Leave you all with a little look back at some of the highlights <laughs> over the last 40 years. See how you think it compares. <laughs> Hello, and uh, here we are for the first of our weekly question time. Yes, Mrs Thatcher has gone to Europe. She's banged just about every conference uh, table in Europe demanding changes. Andrew Dale. Well, I'm glad that the Labour Party's finally made up its mind that it wants to stay in Europe, <laughs> uh, because that's a major achievement for a start. When a minority of members effectively behave like a football hooligan terrorist mob 
and deliberately try with a football terrace type chant to prevent someone from completing their speech. But what the Labour Party has been saying, we've been saying this all along, is that there is an alternative, and that alternative is based not on dogma, but on common sense. And why is it always millionaires like years. yourself get uptight about £2 an hour for people on minimum wage? Well, I'll tell you. Why do you always I'll have tell to you. do that? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Because I know something about actually creating jobs as opposed to just talking well, about it. You've obviously done a lot better than yeah. your workers yes. have. Which one is Mr. Roger Freeman? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Roger Freeman, oh, no, please. Chancellor for the Duchess of Lancaster, Minister for Public Service, and Citizen Charter, Member of Keating. What's the matter with you? Where did you get all that right? Well, suppose someone was watching this programme in France. They'd see a whole load of, of Brits are worrying again about whether their beef is safe. I have to say that one thing I agree with on, with Diane Abbott on is that I haven't been eating French cold and delicious for a long time either. You don't have to have a, a referendum. I think, I think on an issue of great constitutional importance, it is right to ask people what they think. I think the European Constitution is a great mistake. So I think we need to really get back to their job being to make sure that the long-term interests of the bank are met rather than anyone else's. OK. Let's go. Let, let, uh, uh, um, and now we're in this situation. We're all going down that fork. And you're, it's time for bed. <laughs> <laughs> this is my stopwatch saying it's bedtime. <laughs> Thank you very much for staying up so late. You may now go to bed. Sleep well. Thank you for watching. Join us again next Thursday from Glasgow. Until then, good night. From Cardiff, good night. Yeah.